Okay, welcome back. So we've got as far as defining what a card is. A card was a data type, a new data type, which contains a rank and a suit. Let's define a function over that data type to get a feel for how that works. The function that we uh, have in mind here, which could be very useful in card games, is a function which determines whether one card, the first card, beats the second card. So I'll give two ways of defining that using pattern matching and without pattern matching using our selection functions. Now what you notice in here is that I have a stub code uh, in which it says card beats equals undefined. It's actually a very useful way to add functions and their types to a program in a way that guarantees they will still compile. You can't do anything with them. The, the definition of undefined uh, will just immediately crash. Undefined, exception, probably to undefined, doesn't do anything. Um, but if you put it in a program, it will always type check. Right? So is that magic? That's just the question I was going to ask you. What's the type of undefined? Undefined. Oh, I <laughs> so undefined is an expression, not a type. So in Haskell, the worlds are pretty separate, but that was a good guess. The type of undefined is indeed A. It could have said B. It doesn't matter. What it means when you have a free variable, a small letter, it means, just means for all A, it can be an A. It, it, I can be any A you like. That's what it's saying. Which means it always fits in. If you have a bit of a program you're not quite sure about, you can always put in undefined, and it, it can pretend to be any type that the program needs at that point, enabling you to type check the rest of the program. Question? What happens if you define A? You can't define A because A doesn't start with a capital letter. All types begin with a capital letter. <coughs> It doesn't begin with a capital letter, and it uh, is a, used as a type, then it means it's a, basically a free variable. It's, it's for all quantified, implicitly. So it's your generic parameter, if you like. Yeah. All right. Okay, so this can be handy for building up programs incrementally, type-checking programs incrementally. All right, so this is a function which, given two cards, gives us a, a boolean, tells us whether the cards are, um, when, whether the first card beats the second card. So what do two cards look like? Well, if we call them C1 and C2, then what we want to know is that the ranks of the, so, okay, when does a card beat another card? Okay, we have to agree on that before we can actually define the defin give the definition. It depends on the card game. But in, in many card games, you, only, you can only compare two cards if they have the same suit. So the only way to beat a heart is with another heart. The only way to beat a spade is with another spade. Now, there are games in which the suits themselves are ordered, or you have a, a, a suit which is special, a trump. Um, but if we ignore all those various finesses, we'll take the version of when one card beats another, which insists that the two suits are the same. So the suit of C1 should equal the suit of C2. And C1 rank beats C2. Is that right? Am I using that correctly? No. Ah. Couldn't match the expected type rank with the actual type card. So rank beats only works on ranks. So. Okay, it wasn't. Okay, yeah. So it's the rank of C1 has to beat the rank of C2. Okay. How else could we have defined it? Well, we could have defined it without using our selector functions. We could define it using pattern matching. Um, so if we define it using pattern matching, then oops, I'm in trouble with my completion here. 
Um, then we have to write patterns. Card C um, rank one uh, suit one. Is it rank then suit? Yeah. Card rank two suit two. If we have two cards that look like that, then we need that the the suits have to match. And rank one, rank beats, rank two. Okay, so two definitions, exactly the same length uh, of the same function. Now. Okay, so there are two ways of defining the same thing. There's no there's no difference between them. That I can... Any questions about that? Excellent. Oh. Card beats, um, card ace, spades, card jack, hearts, false. What? What have I done wrong? Yeah, with the different suits, of course. Ace of space beat, yes, thank you. Had a momentarily brain lapse. Okay, so we've modeled a card. We've done a, examples of a function on cards. What's the next step? Well, we need to model in a game of cards, not just a single card, but a collection of cards, a hand of cards. So to model a hand of cards... A hand of cards is, is one or more, or sorry, zero, or let's say zero or more cards. How do we model zero or more things of a particular type? We have a list. The natural way to model a hand of cards is to use a list. We're not going to use a list. Not because it's not good to use a list. It's excellent to use a list. You should use a list. We're not going to use a list. We're going to do something else because we want to introduce more of the concepts involved in building your own data types. We won't learn as much if we use a list, so we will build our own data type, which will basically be like a list, but we're going to do it ourselves for pedagogical reasons. Okay? So if you were really going to write some code to deal with a card game, then I think a list would be a good choice. But we're going to try and do it a different way. And this applies also to the, uh, to the second lab. So what is a hand then? A hand of card consists of, well, a bunch of cards. You might say hand um, one card, two cards, something like that. I don't know. We can't do it like that. We, can't, we don't know how many, how many cards we need. A distinction we can make, though, is that a hand of cards is either one of two things. It's either an empty hand or it's a non-empty hand. A non-empty hand is obtained by adding a card to a hand. If you add at least one card to any hand, you'll get a non-empty hand, right? We can use that distinction as the basis of our case distinction in the, the type. We can have an empty hand, that's an easy one, or if it's not an empty hand, it's the result of adding a card to something. And what's that something? It's a hand. So that's the definition of the data type. What do you notice about the data type definition? It's recursive. Yay! Recursion not only in the functions we define, but also in the data that we define. So every hand of cards can be built up by either by these two constructors. Empty, for building the smallest hand you can have, and the add constructor, which builds a hand, one of those things, by adding a card to a hand you already have. So you can build any card, by, st by any hand you like, by starting with the empty hand and adding cards to that and then you get what you need. 
Okay. Let me give us some. I have a couple of examples here. There's a couple of examples of a hand. There's a hand with just one card obtained by adding <coughs> the ace of hearts to the empty hand. And here's another hand obtained by adding the ace of spades to the previous hand. So they're two definitions that we can compute. If we reload that file, we can x hand 2. Ah, no instance for show hand. Of course, the usual story. We need to derive show. Should we derive some other stuff while we're here? What do you think of that? Is that a good idea? Well, equality, derived equality on hands. What does it mean? What's, gonna, what's likely to go wrong if we let the Haskell compiler work out how to tell if two hands are equal? Order of cards. If we let Haskell decide when two hands are equal, it will say that two hands are different just because I've shuffled the cards in my hand into a different order. So actually, derived equality wouldn't really make sense for a hand of cards. So actually, it's not a, a sensible thing to include. If we need equality on hands of cards, we really need to view them as a set. And so we need to make sure that it doesn't matter what order they're in when we compare them for equality. We're not going to do, use that as an example. But if we did, we'd want to define our own equality and not use the derived equality. But at least we certainly want to print them um, for the moment so we can look at what we're doing. Uh, and there, if, we, if I evaluate that example, it doesn't do anything exciting. It doesn't even print very prettily, but that's the uh, derived show operation that I get. It prints it as it is. We could, of course, define our own one and print it in a nicer way. Any questions about that? Okay. So that was our hand. It was either empty or the result of adding a card to another hand. All right. Let's define an interesting function. When does a hand beat a given card? So in many card games, there's a card on the table. You have a hand of cards, and you've got to beat that card by choosing one of them. So the first step is to actually work out whether you can beat it. Can you beat the card on the table? In other words, do you have a card in your hand which beats the card on the table? So let's define a function which computes that. Given a hand and a card, computes whether it can beat the hand can beat the card or not. Okay. Well, we're going to use pattern matching. We're going to use pattern matching. We can use pattern matching on actually both parts, but the, the one that we really uh, have to pattern match on here is the hand. And there are two cases, an empty hand and a card, or a non-empty hand, which is the result of adding a card C prime to an existing hand. So we have two cases. Line them up just for readability. So, if I, if I don't have any cards, can I beat this card? No. If I have this card, can I beat this card? Well, I can if this card, a uh, card beats this card. C prime card beats C. If this, sorry, I'm missing a back quote. If C prime, the card I've got, can beat C, if the answer for this is true, then the answer for the whole thing is true. Okay, but what if this card can't beat C? Is the answer false? We should check the remaining ha hand of cards. So either the, card, the top card should beat this guy for me to be able to beat it, or the rest of the hand should be able to beat it. The rest of the hand is H. 
and the card we're trying to beat is C. So we have a recursive definition. We have a recursive data type. How do we do things with a recursive data type? We have to use recursion. In order to be able to walk across a recursive data type, we need a recursive function. So what this says is we can beat, the, we can beat a card either if the first one can beat it or if the rest of the hand can beat it. Okay? Any questions about that? All right, so for example, um, if we have the example hand one, and let's say um, x hand two, oops, hand beats, I'm not, I'm not spelling this right, am I? X hand two hand beats. Um, does it hand beat the jack of the card jack of diamonds? Can that hand beat that card? There it is. There's the hand. Um, yeah, so we don't have a diamond, so the answer should be false. Oh, what have I done? Oh, yes, that's why it couldn't complete the word, because I spelt it wrong. It's this function, small h. It can't. But if I, if I wanted to try and beat the jack of spades, then, of course, I could beat it. Any questions? Excellent. All right, what's the next step? Let's have a look at. The next step is to choose a card. Okay, so beating a. Where are we? Oops. So beating a. Um, being able to beat a card is one thing, but you also have to be able to choose a card from a hand to beat a given card, right? So let's have a look at the slides on this example. So this is a trickier example, okay? When you play cards, you need to know, you, it's good to know whether you can beat a given card, right? But what you want to do is, A, beat the card with the worst card you have, if you can. If you can't beat the card, then you simply want to play your worst card. But there are usually rules. And the rules usually say that if there's a diamond on the table, for example, and I have a diamond in my hand, even if I can't beat it, I still have to play the diamond. Okay? This is a typical card game rule. So some of you have played cards, and this will be all very obvious. Some of you haven't. Okay, these rules are a bit arbitrary. That's just the way that some card games work. It makes for a fairly complicated definition of how I should best choose a card from a hand if there's a given card being played. Okay? So, um, so there's a list of a strategy here. Let me just look at a picture. So if there's a two of uh, hearts here, what card should I play from the hand below? I can't beat it because I don't have any hearts, so I have to. I should be choosing the worst card of my hand, which is the five of clubs. Okay, we're not going to be super subtle about this, um, so we're not going to take into account how many of these cards we have. If I were to add to my deck the four of hearts, then of course now I wouldn't want to play the five of clubs. If I had an extra card, a four of hearts, I'd want to play that instead. Okay because that can beat it. Another example might be the nine of diamonds. Here, the rules tell me that even though I can't beat it, I still have to play my diamond. So I have to play the seven of diamonds. That's just the card rule. Um, it's another example. Here's a, here's a card that I 
can beat. Um, so I actually, in this case, want to choose the best card of the two that, that are of the same suit, namely the jack. And so the code suggested in the lecture notes for this is this complicated beast. Notice that it doesn't actually use our hands beat function. What it does is work out which card it is from scratch. Okay, so let me just look at one example from here. If we're choosing the card, if we're trying to beat this card, and we only have one card, then it's real easy, right? That's the only card we can play. So that's the card we have to play. It doesn't matter whether we win or lose, we're going to play that card. Otherwise, if we have a card and a non-empty hand, so we have more than one card, we're going to use recursion, we're going to compare the best hand to the best card to play from the rest of the pack with the card at the top of the pack. We're going to either play the best hand from the rest of the pack or the card from the top of the pack. And then there's a bunch of rules which determine, according to the various cases, which one we should do. Okay? It's a bit tricky and a bit fiddly. Let's go back to the, the actual code for this. Okay, so I've, I've commented it out here, actually. So what I've actually done here is I've slightly rewritten the example from the lecture notes. There was a bit of cut-and-paste programming going on down here, which I've turned into a function. And this works out the case when the first card matches the suit. It's the trumps, if you like. And the second card doesn't match the suit. In that case... We always have to choose the first card. The other thing that I've got is a rank min function. Where I'm using local definitions here. The rank min function, instead of actually work out which card, whether one card is better than another, actually gives you the card which is, is better. So when, when one card rank beats the other card, it gives you the worst of the two cards, the minimum of the two cards. Okay. Now, you don't have to really pour over the details of this and try and understand all the details. That's not the point of the example. The point of the example is that these kind of things can get a bit tr tricky, a bit fiddly. It's clear we need to test these kind of definitions. Right? We're not going to live with just saying, yeah, my logic's good, it'll work. We need some way of testing it. So a good way of testing these kind of things is using this property-based testing that we're using a lot, we're going to use a lot in this course. So what property can we use? Well, what we have is a much simpler function. We have a function hands beats, hand beats. It's a function that is, in some sense, should be a lot more reliable. We, we can trust it because the definition is a lot simpler. Okay, maybe not today, maybe tomorrow. By tomorrow you'll trust it because the definition is simple. Maybe today it still looks like magic. So what we can do is use our simpler and more obviously correct thing to try and determine whether this card is good. So how can we do that? Well, choose card should choose a, a card from the hand. It should choose a winning card precisely when the hand can beat the card. So if the hand can beat the card, then choose card, better, well, better pick a winning card. Otherwise there's something seriously wrong. And vice versa, if the hand can't beat the card, then choose card should not pick a winning card. It can't magically pull a card from up its sleeve, out of its sleeve. Okay, So then it should pick a losing card. So that's one simple test that we can encode as a property. Let's call it property um, win. It's a property that relates a card and a hand. And we're asking whether we're going to check whether this choose card thing is, is giving us the right answer. So our first attempt then is to say the hand beats, uh, which is the order in hand beats, It takes a hand first and then a card. So if that hand, 
I should write it in infix, shouldn't I? And then I don't have to think so hard. If the hand hand beats the card, whether that gives you true or false, it should give you the same answer as whether the card you choose um, can beat the card given. The, ch the card I should choose should beat the hand given, the card given, precisely when the hand can beat the card given. Okay? So we're testing the equality of this Boolean expression and this Boolean expression. Okay? Shall we try it? Okay, not in scope, quick check. Get back up to the top here. Let's import test.quick check. Okay, we're still having a, an issue. What is our issue here? Ah, good, good point. That sounds like something we shouldn't be doing. We're using card beats between two cards here. That's, that's okay, but sorry, I'm going too far. Where are we? There it is. Um, yes, it should be card beats. Ah, yes, this is a card, and it should card beat. Yeah. Well spotted. Okay, that should compile. Yes. Okay. Quick check it. Quick check. Prop win. Okay. No instance for arbitrary card, arbitrary hand. When quick check runs, it has to generate random values of a data type. There is a class for things where you have random generators it's called arbitrary. But unfortunately, our new data type is not a member of this class. We would probably like to write deriving arbitrary to make automatic uh, arbitrary derivation. It is conceivable that it's possible, but quick check is just a, a library in user land. It's not part of the language. So there's no special compiler support for the quick check library that we're using. That means that we have to define random generators ourselves if we want to use random testing on quick check. We're not going to do that today, okay? We are going to do that because it's good fun uh, and very useful, but we're not going to do it in today's lecture. So what I'm going to do is uncomment some magic that we need to do that. It will be magic that tells it how to generate an arbitrary suit by picking a random element from this list, an arbitrary rank by doing a bunch of other things, and building an arbitrary card by taking an arbitrary rank, an arbitrary suit, and putting them together in a card. This won't make any sense to you for the moment. Don't worry about that. We'll come to that later. But having uncommented that magic, we should now be able to test. And we did test it, and it failed. Why did it fail? Well, it failed with an exception. Non-exhaustive patterns in function choose card. It failed here with empty. Choosing a card from the empty hand. What card should I, should I choose? Any suggestions? There's no, there's no sensible choice. You can't choose a card from an empty hand. The point is, in fact, that the property that we're interested in is a property that, we, that should only hold for a non-empty hand. We, don't, we simply can't choose a hand a card from a non-empty hand. So this is a property for non-empty hands. There are two ways to fix this. One is to generate, to build a test and never and make sure that the hand has at least one card in it. Always. So instead of H here, we need to add a card to H. So we could do that by adding an extra parameter, a second card, to our property. 
if you have a card and a hand, you can always build a non-empty hand by adding the card to the hand. That's one way of fixing it. It gets sometimes a bit messy to have to add in extra parameters all the time. But there's another way to do it, and that is using a quick check operator that allows us to filter values that we don't want to use in tests. The value that we don't want to use in tests is we don't want hands which are empty. So the syntax is that we use a, something that looks like a logical implication, but it's not. It's a quick check uh, function. We want to say that if h is not equal to empty, then that's the test we want to perform. So whenever h is chosen to be empty, it's not counted as a proper test. We throw it away and generate another random test. Okay. Let's, let's have a go at compiling that. We fail. Why did we fail? Did we do quick check wrong? Well, actually, no. Hand, remember, we argued that hand shouldn't be, we shouldn't have the equality operation on hand. We argued that because we really want to take into account the order. Now we've been bitten by that because we haven't got the equality operation by, on hand. Equality and inequality go hand in hand. So we can't use inequality because that's also one of the things derived in the EQ class. Okay? So what do we do? Well, we could add it back to hand and then promise not to use equality, just use inequality, and only for testing with empty. We could do that. Or we could just say, all we need is a little function is empty. That's all we need. So let's do it that way instead. We need to, um, or rather, what is it? We don't want is empty. We want is non-empty h. If we have a non-empty hand, then we'll, we'll do the test. Let's define that as a local function. I don't think we're going to use that anywhere else. Oh, is, is non-empty, I want to say. Is non-empty. Is non-empty. So when is a hand non-empty? Um, well, if it's empty, that's false. Is not empty. Anything else is true. There's a little definition that we can use locally. And it compiles. Now, finally, we can quick check it. We can quick check it. But... We're not quite there yet, and I've yeah, something I forgot to do here. Um, okay, after 23 tests, it found that if we try and play this, if we're trying to beat this card with this hand, then the property fails. Now, the, the, the problem here is that the, the example is rather big. So what I forgot to do, what we forgot to do when we defined this module, this uh, testing code, is to tell it how to find smaller examples. So I'm just going to add some code quickly to this without you ex expecting you to understand what I'm doing here. I need a way to shrink a counterexample. So I can do that by defining a function. Now, okay, just just bear with me for a minute. You're not you don't need to understand this, but let me just explain the strategy. Sh quick check finds counterexamples. Great. Counterexamples can be monstrous. They can be huge. We want to find small counterexamples, but quick check, given a big counterexample, doesn't know how to find smaller ones. What we can do is give it a hint. And the hint is a function which, given a thing, gives a list of slightly smaller things that quick check can use to try, having found a big counterexample, to try and find a smaller counterexample. If we have a hand of cards and as a counterexample, how do we find... What's a good idea for suggesting finding a smaller counterexample? Well, this many cards. We've got to find a smaller counterexample. Well, the smaller counterexamples we could try is this hand, this hand, this hand, this hand, and so on. So we remove one card from the collection of hands. So I'm just going to quickly define a function that will do that. If I have the empty hand, nothing I can do. If I have add a card to a hand, then the list I want should contain the rest of the hand. That's what I get by removing the first card. And then I want all the possible other combinations.
and that should do it. Now, you don't have to understand this for now. You understand the strategy. Okay, that shrink function works. Let's try the quick check again. Hopefully, we'll get a small counterexample. And there we have it. It's a counterexample with just two cards in it. And that's what we want. The cards... So we have a queen of hearts, and what we're doing is we've got a numeric, a nine of hearts, and a king of hearts. Obviously, what's happening is we're playing, by mistake, we're playing the smallest card, which doesn't beat it, instead of playing the bigger card. Bigger card. So when we've got to the case where we choose the smallest of the two cards, we're assuming that they both beat the card we want. But in fact, sometimes one of them beats and the other one doesn't. That's the fix that we need to implement. So in the last minute or two, I will implement that fix. We've forgotten a case. The case we've forgotten is when um, C um, card beats the card to beat and not negation of C prime. So one of them beats the card and the other one doesn't. That's the case that we have in our counterexample. And then in that case, we always have to choose the card, the better card. And the other case is the converse of that. When we swap C prime and C, just try that out. Yes. <laughs> Whew. Um, okay. Now, what time is that? Oh. We've got plenty of time. So you should be slightly disgusted with me at this point in time, because I just did a bit of cut and paste programming. You shouldn't. You know that whenever you're cutting and paste chunks of code, you're doing something wrong, right? So I want you to imagine when you're programming and you do cut and paste chunks of code, I'm looking over your shoulder. Okay? <laughs> Feel bad. It's bad. Um, so actually, this was the same factorization that I did previously as compared to the what's on the slide, I notice that I'm doing two things which are almost the same, but not quite. So I, I it's, it's, if you do that, then really you should define a function for that. So I'm going to define a function which checks whether the first thing beats and the second thing doesn't beat. So I'm going to call it beats, not beats, which takes card one and card two, and it's going to do something like this. So this cut and paste is legitimate because I'm using it to refactor. So card one beats the card to beat. And card two does not beat the card to beat. Then we need to choose card one. Uh, sorry, that was a guard. Okay, yeah, that's right. That's it's a sorry, it's a test. It's a test. We're testing whether the card one beats card two. So what we can do is replace this by let's call that beats not beats. Refactor this. This is beats not beats applied to card and card prime. And this one here is the converse, namely beats, not beats, card prime, card. Okay, just line those up. Okay, so we have now our four cases based on those two helper functions. Let's just move this one back up here. And that was called trumps, no trumps. It's when one of them has the right suit and the other one doesn't. And this one is when one card beats and the other one doesn't. So they're rather similar in style. Okay, and that's our final refactored thing. I refactored it, but let me just check I haven't made any errors in the process. 
I haven't introduced anything new. Excellent. Okay, so there was our property um, of winning. We take a non-empty hand and we check the property, and that property is in indeed true. It's not the only property. You can come up with other properties. Any suggestions of other properties that we expect our choose card to have? There are lots of obvious ones. This property doesn't guarantee that we choose the best possible card. It just shows that we choose yeah. the acceptable card. We choose an acceptable card, yes. Uh, the best one should be the smallest winning card. Yeah. So you would maybe like to, amongst all the winning cards, determine which is the smallest and make sure that choose card picks that. But there are actually some much more basic properties that you could check. Well, choose card shouldn't pick a card from the sleeve, right? In other words, the card that it plays should be a card that's actually in the hand, right? It's one example of a, a nice property. Another property is that it shouldn't play, if it's got to try and play against a diamond, it shouldn't play a non-diamond if it has a diamond. So you have to follow suit. That's the cheating rule. So it shouldn't cheat. Okay. And there's a bunch of other things. So there's quite a lot of things you could test, uh, all of which may reveal slightly different bugs in the code. Okay, that's all the code that I want to look at. Let me just go back to the slides to round up. Okay, we learned a bunch of things, I hope. We learned about data types. Brew your own data types. That's nice. We learned that these data types can be recursive and they can have structure. They're not just simple enumerations. When we have recursive data types, we have to define recursive functions in order to use those data types effectively. Uh, so these things go hand in hand. And we've seen a bit about writing properties of more complex things. We've also seen that there's some quick check stuff that we haven't learned about yet that would be kind of cool to learn about at some point soon. Uh, and we'll certainly do that. Now, I just want to round up in the last minute by linking back to lists. In the next lecture, we're going to go back to talk about lists. There's a lot more we can say about lists and about functions. Um, so I want to do that. But I want to link between user-defined data types and our data types. So really what we've done is defined our own list type. A hand is just a list of cards. And a list is either an empty or a non-empty thing. Lists basically work in the same way. If you remember, lists were collections of things all of the same type, where the order matters. And there is a syntax which allows us to take this basic syntax. This is five on the front of the list, six on the front of, and so on. The brackets we don't need because the operator for building a list <coughs> is right associative. And there is a nice syntax, a nice way of showing, printing a list between brackets that makes this look easier to read, namely by putting the values and commas in between. This is just syntactic sugar. Lists are built in, and this syntax is built in. But basically, if we think of lists like this guy here, then they're very similar to our data type for a hand. But what's different? Well, if we imagine we were defining a list, what would it look like? Well, it would look very like a hand. We'd have an empty list, or we'd have a list that results from adding a thing to another list. But what's the thing? What type should we put there? Any ideas? What should we put there? What thing should we add? A. It's an A. It's an anything you like, right? We can build a list of anything you like, can we? If we put a bool on the front of a list, that's good, isn't it? We can build lists of bulls. Well, we can, but the list itself should be a list of bull. If the list itself is a list of ints, we can't put a bool on the front. So it can't be just any A on the front of a list. How do we fix that? Well, we fix that by actually making the A a parameter of the type. So A is a type parameter. This A ranges over a type. It could be bool, it could be int, it could be a list of int. But whatever list it is, that's what we need to add. That's the element type that we add to the front of the list. And that's the type of the list that we're adding to. 
So this is a whole family of types, a whole collection of types. It's a list of bool, a list of ints, so on and so on. We define it with a single definition. We get all the possible kinds of lists that we might want. The only difference with Haskell lists from this definition is that Haskell lists have a special syntax to make them nicer to write down. It has a symbol instead of a word for the empty list. It uses a, an infix operator instead of the add constructor. Now, the infix operator you can define yourself. That is something you can define yourself. But the symbolic empty list we can't. We can define our own printing routine to print values any way we like. But that doesn't mean that we can write the values down any way we like. We'd actually have to write it, we'd actually have to parse the value. And they're the things that are built in to Haskell. They make the syntax of lists a little bit smoother. Otherwise, with this definition, you really understand pretty much all there is to know about Haskell lists. Of course, we need to look at a lot uh, many more examples before we really understand it. And that's what we'll be doing in the next lecture.